Good evening, and thank you for logging in tonight. My name is Casey Swid. I'm the marketing coordinator here at Cell Science Systems. Just a few announcements before we get started with Dr. Holden. Um, if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them in the question box on your control panel, and we'll be sure to answer them at the end of the webinar. Also, we're planning to go about an hour tonight, so if we don't get to your question, we'll be sure to follow up with you after the webinar. Um, we're really excited to have Dr. Holden here with us tonight, and without further ado, here he is. Thanks, Casey. If anyone has any problem with audio on their end from my part, just type a chat to Casey and let her know. Otherwise, uh, I am uh, Keith Holden. I am board certified in internal medicine. I practice a combination of internal medicine, functional medicine, and European biological medicine. I do want to say that I am going to mention some specific brands of supplements tonight, some specific remedies, not because I think uh, they're the greatest or because I think I have a uh, financial affiliation, but because I remember when I first started training in functional medicine, I wanted specifics and that's one reason, but the other reason is because these specific remedies I've used um, have, I've found very beneficial for my patients. I want to commend everyone for joining us tonight. I know most of you are practitioners and I want to Thank you for being a pioneer in your field of medicine. You're not waiting for the traditional medical model to give you information. You're going out learning it on your own and applying the latest and the greatest in a clinical setting. And you're making grassroots changes, and I commend you for that. So we're going to talk about gut health and systemic disease tonight. And let's get started. This first graph shows mainly how systemic complaints re can result from food allergies and food sensitivities. And usually, as I tell my patients, it's always a perfect storm. When there is disease presentation, it's always a perfect storm. Inevitably, inevitably there are multiple contributors. So if you look how systemic complaints start from food sensitivities, you'll see that oftentimes there's genetic predispositions. Some people have low hydrochloric acid in their stomach. Others have reduced pancreatic enzyme function. Others have had surgery that's impairing their GI function. And plenty of people are on medications that interfere with optimal GI function. Then you end up getting inadequately digested proteins in the GI tract. This results in inflammation because the immune system does not like inadequately digested proteins especially when they start to cross in, through the gut lining. It's this, and the crossing through the gut lining is a result of increased intestinal, per, intestinal permeability or leaky gut. You get an, when this happens, the immune system starts to look at these foreign objects as, as intruders and results in attack, and this can result in a sustained inflammatory response that ultimately can become systemic through a cascade of cytokine release. You also get overload of liver detoxification pathways since everything in the GI tract has to be detoxified through the liver. The immune complexes flow into the general circulation as a result of the immune chaos, and you end up getting distant signs and symptoms. So if we look at the gut, it's the largest area we're exposed to our environment. You, some would think the skin, but it really is the GI tract. It's also where we have our immune system directly interacting with what's coming in from our environment. And when you get gut immune dysregulation and excessive inflammation, you're, you're going to get systemic disease. So if we the research is starting to tell us now how autoimmune diseases occur. About Ten years ago in my internal medicine practice, my patients with lupus or rheumatoid would ask me, why did I get this? Why do I get it? Um, what causes this? And I honestly would tell them, we don't know. Well, the great thing about today in 
is that we're starting to learn what's causing autoimmune disease. And we're finding that there are three things involved for sure. It's an environmental trigger. Typically, these are food, food sensitivities, microbes, um, improperly digested food proteins. And you have to have that combination with a genetic tendency for the immune system to overact to the triggers or antigens. And the third thing that coexists that can result in autoimmune disease is intestinal hyperpermeability. The peer-reviewed medical research has definitely shown an association between intestinal hyperpermeability and diseases such as celiac disease, type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid, and the inflammatory bowel diseases. So Dr. Alessio Fasano at the University of Maryland is doing groundbreaking research on celiac disease, and he is discovering what may be the clues for autoimmunity, because we know celiac disease is an autoimmune disease. So as he unravels the issues here, he finds that this triad exists. There's an environmental trigger, an antigen, in this case gluten. There is genetic susceptibility in these individuals with HLA-DQ2 and HLA-DQ8 patterns. And these specific HLA patterns in are particularly efficient at presenting the gluten antigen to the immune cells. This results in overstimulation of the immune cells, sustained inflammatory response, and then you have the intestinal hyperpermeability component where he is finding that tight junctions moderate the permeability of the intestine, and when the proteins that moderate these tight junctions are altered or interfered with or triggered, you can have a sustained intestinal hyperpermeability or leaky gut. So it is this triad that exists as an underlying factor in why autoimmune diseases develop. And Dr. Fasano so eloquently puts it, together with gut-associated lymphoid tissue and the neuroendocrine network, the intestinal barrier with its tight junctions controls the equilibrium between tolerance and immunity to non-self antigens. And when this finely tuned trafficking of macromolecules is dysregulated in genetically susceptible individuals, both intestinal and extraintestinal autoimmune disorders can occur. Now let's switch gears for a minute and talk about a specific microbe that's associated with systemic disease. Helicobacter pylori, it's the most common chronic bacterial infection in the world. It has an affinity for stomach mucosa. It disrupts the permeability of the GI tract and induces a sustained immune response. This results in excessive inflammation. This excessive inflammation is the culprit for why it may progress from chronic atrophic gastritis to full-blown malignancy of the stomach. And then there's the component of molecular mimicry playing a role here. And this is what helps result in systemic autoimmune disease. And this could be the fourth component to that triad that exists. So let's talk about molecular mimicry in more detail and how that plays a role in the development of systemic and autoimmune diseases. Well, what is it? It's simple terms, mistaken identity. So we have these environmental exposures to antigens, whether it's food, food particles, microbes, and you have the genetically susceptible individuals in which there is induced a cross-reaction with structurally similar amino acid motifs that are very similar to that found in the body's tissues. So there is the mistaken identity. It's these sig amino acid motifs on the food particles and the microbes that are structurally similar to our own body's tissue signatures, and the immune system gets confused. When it gets confused, it goes after normal tissue with an inflammatory response. And we know that in celiac disease patients, they have 10, 10 times the rate of autoimmune thyroid disease as non-celiacs, and this is thought to be reflective of the gluten gliadin antigen antibody complexes that attack that are associated with the attack of thyroid tissue. So what other systemic disease what systemic diseases do is H. pylori associated with? And this is from the peer-reviewed medical literature. 
It's associated with ischemic heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, iron deficiency anemia, idiopathic anterior uveitis, autoimmune thyroid disease, and malt lymphoma. So if you have some patients with unexplained iron deficiency or keep having recurring anterior uveitis, even folks with your Hashimoto's and Graves, screen them for H. pylori because it's, if it's there, it's very possibly contributing to the ongoing manifestation of those disease processes. What are some other bacterial associations with systemic disease? And here's a list. I'm not going to read them all out to you. But you see, for example, Klebsiella pneumoniae with ankylosing spondylitis, Ampylobacter jejuniae with Guillain-Barre syndrome, E. coli, hemolytic uremic syndrome, that was all over the news for a while. And then Candida albicans has been associated with the development of atopic dermatitis and even puts people at risk for the development of full-blown celiac disease. Chlamydia has been associated with multiple sclerosis, and the list goes on and on. And these are from peer-reviewed medical journals, these associations. So in summary, we're finding that there is a typical triad associated with the development of systemic disease as it relates to gut health. It is the trigger, whether it's food sensitivities or microbes, the genetic susceptibility, HLA patterns, and the intestinal hyperpermeability. This results in uncontrolled inflammation and secondary systemic disease. What are some other issues associated with the GI tract? Well, it's necessary for proper digestion, assimilation of micronutrients, beneficial bacteria's role in digestion, and the gut-brain axis. But before we leave this slide, I want to reinforce the importance of knowing these issues as it relates to these environmental triggers. You can dig deeper and look for these microbes, and if they're overgrowing in the gut, then they should be eradicated because they do put certain individuals at risk for the development of systemic diseases, specifically autoimmune diseases. So we finally have a place that we can intervene, and it's through the use of these functional medicine laboratory testing, such as microbial analysis of the stool, that we can dig deeper, find these bugs, eradicate them, and hopefully reduce the patient's risk for the development of autoimmune disease. So at the very end of this slide, you see gut-brain axis. I do want to touch on that. You see this very complex uh, slide with a lot of feedback loops, but what I want to point out is that the brain affects the gut, and the gut also affects the brain. You see there's the major highway with the vagus nerve, you, but you also see that there is feedback loops occurring with cytokines, neurotransmitters, and hormones. It's interesting that over 80% of the body's serotonin is found in the gut, not in the brain is one would think. So you have this complex feedback loop set up between the brain and the gut, and it's very important because if you have chronic gut inflammation and leaky gut, you can get a sustained inflammatory response, a chronic release of cytokines, and then you end up with literally inflammation of the brain because there, where there's leaky gut, there is the potential for a leaky blood-brain barrier. Let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about my approach. So what do I do? I want to try and give you some pearls of wisdom tonight so you can take this home and maybe apply some of these concepts in your practice and see if it works for you. But mine is a combination of functional medicine and European biological medicine. So those functional medicine practitioners out there know we always look for antecedents and triggers. Go back as far as you can. When do you last remember feeling well? What are some potential triggers for what's going on now? Were there, was there acne as a kid? They have chronic antibiotic exposure, et cetera. I use detoxification questionnaires. I take a very detailed toxin exposure history past and present. I look for signs and symptoms on their exam and in their history for micronutrient deficiencies, as well as look for signs and symptoms of leaky gut and dysbiosis. 
I do a detailed review of their bowel habits. Why? Because if you ask them if they have constipation, they may say no, and then you ask them, well, how often do you have a bowel movement? Every three days. Well, we know that's constipation, but to them it's normal. So uh, that's very important to go into detail about that. And we want to know a deep, and then we do a, uh, I do a detailed physical exam. What am I looking for in my exam? Well, I definitely want to do a very thorough review of their oridental area. We're looking for plaque, amalgam, crown, bridges. Is there a malocclusion? Um, the mixed metals issue in the mouth, is there a crown, gold crown overlying a silver amalgam filling it? So there is potential for galvanism where the mouth can act like a battery and those two metals can create an electric charge. And some people do not do well with that type of issue going on. So it, that's why it's important that I work with a holistic and biological dentist to assess for this issue. And I always want to ask them, do you have any old root canals? Those are notorious for infection. I have a couple of cases where the these patients were in a, a very large tertiary healthcare system and going south and came to see me and we got a digital panorex of the mouth and sure enough, uh, they had old root canals that were severely infected. No one had picked it up. Even their doc, uh, dentist who had been doing bite wing x-rays did not pick it up. It's when we did the digital panorex that we picked it up and once that was addressed, their, the inflammation really settled down rather quickly. Do they have TMJ? If they do, not only can dentists help, but so can craniosacral therapists and chiropractors. And then they do a very detailed assessment of the tongue, gums, mucous membranes, and tonsils. If they've got chronically enlarged tonsils, that's a big concern. Also, if they've got tonsil lists, those little plaques that form in the tonsil or crypts, or if they've got low-grade exudates intermittently, you need to address that. The European biological practitioners say that the tonsils are the breaker box between the brain and the rest of the body. I think that's a very interesting concept, but they are important and you do need to try and dig deeper to find out what's causing that lymphatic congestion and address it not only from a microbial standpoint, but possibly from a detoxification and drainage standpoint. And I'll mention some remedies later in the talk that, that can do that. What I do a very thorough medication review. Why? Because plenty of people are on medications that are culprits for leaky, leaky gut, micronutrient deficiencies, and microbial overgrowth. The big culprit here is proton pump inhibitors, Prilosec, Carpapil. The panacea for all that ails you from an indigestion standpoint, I'm joking, of course, but it, it, it's, it's a fairly dangerous drug. I mean, it's associated with increased risk for osteoporosis, magnesium, calcium deficiencies associated with increased risk for pneumonia. C. difficile, why? You cut off your hydrochloric acid. Not only is it important for digestion and leaching minerals from your food uh, and digest proper digestion of iron, but it's also important as a first line of defense for your immune system. When the bugs come in into the stomach, they need that hydrochloric, your body needs that hydrochloric acid there to help eradicate them. It's not going to be there if you're on those types of medications or uh, H2 blockers. NSAIDs are a huge culprit for leaky gut. There was one study, I don't remember uh, the year, but it showed that the vast majority of patients on NSAIDs had small diffuse ulcers in their small intestine despite being asymptomatic. They didn't have any abdominal pain, but that Sure is a perfect example of leaky gut. Corticosteroids are a culprit for leaky gut and immune dysfunction. Statins are well known to cause CoQ10 deficiency and antibiotics, as we know, wreak havoc on the immune system at the gut level from a beneficial bacteria standpoint. Then I do a detailed dietary review. Many patients are on the standard American diet, which is very sad. It's a very unhealthy, toxic diet always give them examples, handouts, and a thorough discussion about the functional medicine conference elimination diet. It eliminates the most common food sensitivities and stresses a high fiber, um, healthy diet, high in antioxidants, and low in toxins.
Now, not everyone is open to the functional medicine comprehensive elimination diet. You're going to have to make decisions based on your patient's personality. So that's where ALPAC comes into play because they want to know specifics. There are some people that just want to know specifics and they don't want to do the elimination and reintroduction to see if it's a problem. That's the hard way according to them. So even though that is the gold standard and it is the best way, it's the most accurate way in my opinion to know which which uh, foods people are sensitive to. And again, we go back to that issue, why do we want to address food sensitivities? Well, it acts as an antigen. It acts as a stimulator of the immune system in, suscept in genetically susceptible in individuals in to cause that sustained inflammation, which can result in systemic disease. So that's why we want to address food sensitivities. So the pe people who don't want to do the elimination and reintroduction with a broad approach, I use ALCAT testing, and that measures the change in white blood cells after antigen exposure. These antigens can be foods, additives, coloring, drugs, and molds. I find that it's very accurate as far as getting them to a better place, reducing symptoms, not only gut-wise, but systemically. And there's an interesting study published in the Bariatrician in 1996 that showed 98 percent of the subjects following the ALPAT plan either lost scale weight or improved body composition. And with our epidemic of obesity now, I think this is a very nice tool in our tool chest to assist people with weight loss because there's, a, a, there, this, there's more than this study showing that when you remove food sensitivities based on testing, you will help people lose weight who were otherwise not able to lose it. And this is not even necessarily following a calorie restricted diet, it's just removing the foods they were sensitive to because they're no longer creating that in inflammatory response which keeps the adrenal stressed and the cortisol released and et cetera, et cetera, and that contributes to the weight gain. So these food sensitivity tests are effective and they are amazingly effective at helping people lose weight. Okay, let's switch gears back to what is a priority test for me? Well, it's definitely a microbial analysis of the stool, whether it's a comprehensive digestive stool analysis with parasitology or just looking at microbes. Some of these tests will look at inflammatory markers, bile salts, hydrochloric acid status, pancreatic enzyme status, etc. I don't always use those big, big ones in everyone, but I in 99% of my patients, I'm, I am getting a microbial analysis of the stool, and it's nice if it includes helicobacter pylori screening for the reasons we mentioned earlier. What are we assessing for? We're assessing for dysbiosis or an imbalance of beneficial to potentially pathogenic microbes. Now, this is a test of the distal GI tract, the colon specifically. It does not screen for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. I tend to make that presumptive diagnosis based on signs and symptoms. I mean, if someone's having chronic bloating and gas after eating with systemic symptoms, there's a pretty good chance that they might have small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Either way, I'm going to treat uh, imbalance in the, in the colon pretty similarly to the way I'm going to treat an imbalance in the small intestine. And we'll go into that in more detail in a, in a minute. Those of you in functional medicine already know the five R's of functional medicine, and that those are very important in as far as getting the gut rebalanced. So what are we doing when we remove? We're removing stressors. Now this is interesting. You want to consider biomechanical imbalances, even spine spinal subluxations. Why? Because the nerves are feeding the organs of the GI tract that come out of the spine. You want to assess for imbalances in the jaw, TMJ. You want to look at old emotional toxins. Of course, you want to look at current emotional toxins, but I find that old emotional toxins are a hidden culprit. These are the ones that your patients don't talk about unless you dig deep. Commonly, they are originating in childhood. A lot of times, it's uh, physical, emotional, or sexual abuse. And it is important to dig deep and get to those root issues because if they're an unresolved issue for the patient, 
and then they're going to continue to stress the autonomic nervous system, which is your autopilot, and it keeps it in a fight or flight situation. And we know that suppresses the immune system. So you've got to go after emotional toxins. If you're not comfortable doing that, then you need to refer them to someone who has food sensitivities. We just talked about that. We want to look at detoxification of external and endotoxins, and we're going to go into more detail about what remedies I did use to do that. And then, of course, we're looking at removing the pathogenic microbes we just talked about with this tool analysis. What are we replacing? Well, someone may have hydrochloric acid deficiency. We might be replacing digestive enzymes, bile salts, fiber. How are we repairing? Well, first and foremost, we want to make sure they're getting plenty enough rest, that they're having adequate nutrition or maybe needing to supplement with multivitamins because there are certain vitamins and minerals that are very specific for gut repair. And then I like to use activated B vitamins. Why? Because there is a percentage of our population that are unable to form activated B vitamins. Specifically, they're not able to convert folic acid to the um, fat-soluble active form, and that, that form is important for proper nervous system function. And then how am I going to support the gut-associated lymphoid tissue? We're going to support it with things like lactoferrin, whey, and immunoglobulins. You have to be careful for folks who have um, dairy sensitivities when you use those types of products. And then I encourage green, green tea, anti-inflammatories such as turmeric and essential fatty acids, glutamine, and aloe. We want to re-inoculate with probiotics and consider prebiotics. There is some controversy about using fructooligosaccharides and that they might feed potentially pathogenic bacteria like Klebsiella. I, I will always go with arabinogalactan if I'm going to use a prebiotic just because it, you get two birds with one stone. It feeds the good guys and it also is an immune modulator in a positive way. That is uh, derived from the March Rebalance, very important here. Functional medicine is about teaching patients lifestyle changes, scheduling rest, getting adequate sleep, mindful eating, very important for people with trouble guts. So you want to encourage them to get centered. They need to be seated. That's why some people, it's very important they stay graced before they get started. It settles them into a place of mindfulness when it comes to eating, as a place of gratitude or their nutrition, and it allows the gut to go into a more of a parasympathetic mode, which is where it needs to be when you're digesting. So this is very important to talk to people about mindful eating. No eating in the car, no eating on the road, no eating standing up. You're in a sympathetic predominance when you do that, and you're just not going to get adequate digestion. So for these people with struggling guts, mindful eating is paramount. Okay, I've stressed that enough. Let's go to some other things I do in my practice to help rebalance the patient, and that includes balancing the autonomic nervous system and brain waves, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a second. What are some of my basic nutritional supplements for patients? And I see a lot of patients who are really sick. They either have reached a plateau in their wellness or they're going downhill in the traditional medical model. Usually these patients are just depleted all around. So I typically use a high-potency multivitamin, multimineral with activated B vitamins. There's a nice uh, activated B vitamin complex in a transdermal formulation from Neurobiologics. And I also use a blend of essential fatty acids. This is a fantastic anti-inflammatory once you get up in the 3,000 milligram uh, dose of EPA and DHA per day. And then probiotics, of course vitamin D based on blood levels, and then medical food, which is typically a hypoallergenic rice and pea or rice or pea um, medical food that they can make smoothies. One of my favorites is Zymogen I-5, and it's because they, it is very tasty, it's very palatable, and they add the immunoglobulins to it for immune support. Then looking at specific remedies for removing 
I typically do combinations, and uh, I will use a combination of herbal remedies like GM Microvex with the homeopathic remedies Cygest and Firmus if it's bacterial, or Cyribule and Candida Rope 40 if it's fungal. Now these Centrions and Forma and Pecana remedies you see on this slide, these are German uh, remedies. They're imported and are available through Bioresource Inc out of California. I found after studying European biological medicine that they really augment the functional medicine approach. These Centrion and Sanforma remedies are derived from microorganism parts and they're homeopathic derivatives as such and therefore are completely safe to take. But what they do is besides using the functional medicine approach where you just use herbs to eradicate the European biological remedies such as these allow you to essentially re-educate the immune system on who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. And remember we talked earlier about immune system chaos that exists. So that helps remedy one of the issues here. And then I typically find that people with fungal overgrowth in the gut who have sinus symptoms have fungus in the sinuses. And I like using the Centrion Cyfungin nasal spray. And then another favorite of mine is Argentin 23. It's found in liquid or sprays. It's from Natural Immunogenics. And it is a colloidal suspension of homeopathic silver. It is not, I I'm, I'm, didn't mean to say colloidal. It is a hydrosol suspension of homeopathic silver. It is not colloidal silver, so you cannot get metal toxic on this. And they've even had third party testing on their product to show that. It's one of my favorites. It can be very provoking, meaning if you jump right to that without support of detoxification, the patients can have a uh, detoxification or, or even a Herx reaction. So I don't always use it right up front, but often I use it at some point in time after the patients settle down and they're stronger and they're, and they're better supported. It, it's really a great product. I personally have used it and it's amazing. Uh, I tend to get this uh, little teeny spot between my toes on one foot and, and it always remedies it within a few days if I use the uh, gel. And then this other important point I want to make about the remedies for removing bad guys is that when you go after bad guys, the European biological medicine part of me always uses detoxification support. Now I know that all these nutraceutical companies have plenty of detoxification remedies, mostly in supplement or powder form, but the Pecana remedies, the German homeopathic remedies, take it to the next level in that these are spagyric formulations of plant combinations that are absolutely fantastic. And my my favorite to use when I am going after bad guys in their gut is the Pecana Basic Detoxification and Drainage Kit, Apohepat for liver, Renalix for kidney, and Icterus for lymphatics. And this is one Icterus, which would be great for someone with chronic lymphatic congestion, chronic uh, adenopathy, uh, tonsillar fullness. It, it works quite well. And then I use Centrion Cytetex uh, for hot liver signs and symptoms. And you acupuncturists on, on the call will know what that is. But in a, in a quick overview, it's when, when their detoxification systems are backed up and there's a lot of heat. So you'll see red eyes, red, really red tongue, especially on the sides or the tip. And uh, they may have flushing and um, rosy cheeks. I find that the Centrion side detox works fantastic for that. Now, can you treat H. pylori without antibiotics? As an internist uh, 10 years ago, I would have said absolutely not. You've got to use three drugs or four drugs or whatever. Now I know otherwise because in my own practice, I've successfully eradicated H. pylori in patients. Not everyone. Some people just need the antibiotics, but I like to give it a shot because it's, it's, has the, it doesn't have the potential to cause harm if, it, if it's not in an emergent situation. So I will use orthomolecular products, pyloracil. It's a nice combination. I'll use it for two months, three times a day in combination with lactoferrin, probiotics, and prefer. Um, 
And again, you got to be careful with burn, lactoferrin for people with significant dairy sensitivities. And then you always want to check H. pylori stool antigen one month after completion of therapy. Parasites. Okay, so basically what I've put on this slide is some drugs of choice for each parasite. I'm not going to go into this in detail. Uh, I just wanted to make that available to you as a resource. I do tend to find blastocystis hominis is pretty difficult to eradicate. And you've absolutely got to use combination therapies such as Bactrim and Metronidazole or Bactrim and Alinea or Metronidazole and Alinea. Um, it's a tough bug. I have eradicated Dianetomidiba fragilis, uh, Indolimax nana, just using herbals and, and homeopathics. So it is doable, but some of the other ones are really tough to treat. And then replace. One of my favorite products is, is DGX by Theramedics. It's a broad spectrum, high potency, in multi-enzyme complex and it doesn't have pork in it for those with pork sensitivity. And betaine, if it's necessary to replace their hydrochloric acid, it's, it's better to have betaine product with the pepsin. And then for bile salts, I like standard process colocol. And for people with diabetes or hyperlipidemia, or it's usually both, then I uh, sometimes use um, konjac root uh, as a drink before each meal, and it can still make them more cool and, and theoretically help reduce the spikes in lipids and, and uh, glucose. Repair my favorite combo, it's so simple. Half a cup of George's aloe juice with one teaspoon of glutamine powder two to three times a day. It's very palatable, essentially no taste. George's aloe removes all the impurities. And then green tea, turmeric, and, and the IgG products from Zymage re-inoculate, like that, they're about it complete. And when I want to use really high dose, I use VSL number three, and I typically reserve that for my patients with really stubborn guts or inflammatory bowel disease. It is one of the most studied probiotics on the market. And then if they've got C. diff still, I will use Saccharomyces boulardii. And then my favorite arabinolactin product is Thorn Research Arabinex. And then very important for rebalancing, we talked about addressing emotional toxins. There are therapists out there who do emotional release techniques. I do my own counseling. If you're not comfortable with counseling, then send them out to a holistic counselor. I encourage journaling, especially journeying, journaling on gratitude. There's an inner child meditation on my website. I find it very effective for people who've had traumatic experiences as a child. And then, uh, and then when necessary, we talk about compassionate forgiveness, which is incredibly powerful for uh, releasing old toxins of anger. Um, balancing the autonomic nervous system. My practice, I specifically use pulsed electromagnetic field therapy, the OndaMed, as well as alpha stem microcurrent, cranial electrotherapy stimulation, low level laser. And my latest fantastic find is uh, the Dolphin Neurostim by Acumetics out of out of uh, Canada. It's essentially microcurrent for use on acupuncture points, and it works very well. Who is my referral list? Well, it's no longer the list of an internist. It is a holistic practitioner. So I'm looking for I refer to biological dentists, chiropractors, acupuncturists massage therapists, energy workers, and holistic counselors. So my final advice to you as practitioner, stay open to possibility. See the world through the eyes of a child. And always embrace change. This allows you allows for transformation and growth. And most importantly, even including tonight, take with you what resonates with you and leave the rest alone. So what does that mean? What feels right? And as a as a as a practitioner, the more you empower your intuition and trust your intuition, the better you will be. And finally, something I encourage in, in my patients is mindfulness, and that is being fully present with an intention to embody calmness and equanimity. It's a very powerful process. I wish you all the best of luck, and I will take some questions now.
As I mentioned earlier, um, if you have any questions, please type them into the question box on your control panel, and we will um, address those as they come up. Okay, we have a question here. It says, what do you do for your patients with chronic gastritis to manage symptoms? What do I do for my patient with chronic gastritis symptoms? To manage symptoms. Okay, to manage symptoms. I guess they mean instead of using proton pump inhibitors or, or, or um, H2 blockers. Well, again, I'm going to start with what we started with tonight, and that is a either a comprehensive elimination diet with reintroduction, with emphasis on gluten, because gluten sensitivity is way more prevalent than people realize. And if if necessary, we'll go to ALCAT testing and microbial stool analysis. You really have to dig deeper to know how to properly manage someone with chronic symptoms because there inevitably are multiple players and you have to look for each player and how it's contributing to the problem. But as far as using remedies, I find that the aloe is quite comforting. And there are some other herbal remedies that are in formulations from these nutraceutical companies that are also very soothing to the gut. But the, my emphasis is to dig deep and look for what's causing the symptoms of the gastritis. It may be not what you think it is. All right, thank you for that. Um, another question is, have, have you ever taken care of a patient with POT syndrome or POTS syndrome? No, I actually have not. Okay. Um, and then we have one more question. It says, what was the last treatment, oh, someone asked what was the last treatment you said to rebalance and dolphin neuroskin. Okay. ANS and dolphin neuroskin. Okay, it's, it's called dolphin, as in the fish, neuroskin. N e u r o s t i m, and it's from AccuMedical, a company out of Canada, and I believe their their U.S. office is in actually in Jacksonville, but it is a it's called micro point stimulation, and if you type in dolphin neurostim on Google, it should take you right to their website, but. It's a fantastic little device in that it allows you to treat acupuncture points. Uh, dermatomes, trigger points, with a very low microcurrent of about 2.5 hertz, and it is amazingly effective. And you can use it to balance the autonomic nervous system. It comes with specific protocols for uh, specific conditions. Okay, next question is, knowing that everyone is different, is there an average length of time to treat someone for gut diagnosis? That's a very good question. And I typically tell my patients, we're going to do at least a three-month regimen. And that's a good starting place. And there are some people that need six months. There are some people that need nine months. Some people have a constitutional weakness. As, as the Chinese medicine practitioners would say, and they, that is their weak link. Their gut is their weak link. If their stress is not being properly managed, they're always going to show it at their weak link. So that's what can contribute to ongoing uh, dysbiosis, even though you're using all the adequate therapies. Sometimes it just takes 
a long, longer time in certain individuals, but a good starting place to tell them is three months. Okay, next question. How can ALCAT testing be used to maximize medically supervised weight loss when using VLCD? VLCD? Mm-hmm. Okay. I, I, I'm not a medically supervised weight loss specialist. That's not really what I do in my practice, so I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that question, but I can tell you that there is more than one study with ALCAT showing that it is effective for uh, people with obesity and helps them to lose weight even though they're not necessarily on a calorie restricted diet. Once they remove the inflammatory foods, their body started to regulate more properly and their metabolism shifts on that is uh, very effective for certain individuals. Okay. Um, Next question is, what is your treatment for SIBO? You know, I, I used to try, and that's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and I used to try the antibiotics, and I just found that I got nowhere. So once I started using the herbal complexes like the GI microbex or the undecilex, and I combined them with the uh, German homeopathic remedies, the Centrion, Symforma, Papana remedies, along with probiotics, I found that I had more success in treating the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And there's there's plenty of patients that I have to resort to use using the uh, hydrosol silver with all those products. I mean, some people have really stubborn guts, and you've got to pull out all the guns. But at the same time, most of those folks are not managing their stress or there's another hidden infection such as in the dental area that you've got to keep digging deep for if they don't start to resolve. But I have uh, treated successfully treated SIBO with these uh, remedies I mentioned in my slides tonight and did not resort to antibiotics. Okay. Next question is where did you go to learn more about European biological medicine? That's a good question, and um, I was very lucky to have been associated with a clinic who was a European Biological Medicine Center and had a visiting physician from Switzerland four to six times a year, and he was my mentor, and every time he was in the U.S., I, I went to the clinic and shadowed him. And that's where I learned the majority, but the rest was just learning it on my own, reading about it online. And uh, but I was very lucky to have that opportunity. Okay. Another question. Uh, if, I want to say if you go on BioResource Inc.'s website and you sign up and you get in the practitioner area, they do have education guides that that are pretty helpful as far as knowing how to use those specific uh, remedies from Germany. All right. Um, someone else wants to know if you do phone consultations for patients who live far away? I, legally, I can't do that in the state of Florida. I, I can only do it if I've had a face-to-face, -face, but I will be glad to talk to any practitioners who want to call me and get some advice on a patient. I don't have a problem with that at all. Okay, and um, the next question, somebody just wrote, any comments on autism? You know, I, I'm, a, I'm an adult physician, internal medicine, and, I, and that's just, I don't have a lot of experience with children other than my training in uh, med school, and, and uh, that's about it. So I don't have a lot of experience with autism. Uh, I leave that to the uh, autism practitioners. All right, and then one more question. Somebody um, mentioned that they didn't get all the slides, um, but just let everybody know that the slides will be available online. Um, the webinar is being recorded, and um, they'll be posted on our website in the next couple of days um, if you want to view them there. And I think that's about it. We're going to wrap it up. So I want to thank Dr. Holden again for um, giving a great presentation tonight. Okay, thank you very much. All right, and have a great night, everybody.